Hey, good morning from Walla Walla, Washington. Now, I bought this old Axelson lathe, and the total cost from it being shipped from Ohio to here, plus uh, the eBay price, was $5,000. And it came with one chuck, and uh, that's about it. And uh, so I had to buy chucks and tool holders, and some of it was given to me. <laughs> and some of it I, I found on eBay, some of it I found locally. But I've got just over $8,000 into this machine. And uh, that's a substantial enough sum that uh, I want the machine to work as good as possible. And uh, the only way I could figure out this machine here, which is a little bit different from other lathes, and I'll show you some things about it, um, to make it work this good. And I'll show you how good I got it working. So the last couple of videos, I've been working on aluminum pieces here. And uh, let's see, on the uh, Mintatoyo dial snap gauge, if I can get that uh, settled in, it's two thousand, two ten thousandths, 200 millionths, under zero right there. We'll put it in the middle. It's reading one hundred thousandths, uh, one hundred millionths, under zero. And get it over here to the end. And it's reading just about three hundred thousandths, under zero there. So I've got that piece straight, and that piece is six inches long with uh, in two ten thousandths or two hundred millionths, which is really remarkable for this old machine. And uh, to do that, I had to I had to keep testing it, make adjustments, and figure out how to make those adjustments. And this uh, machine's got several, uh, just multiple adjustments on it. It's got uh, the, uh, it's got a duplex uh, cross feed nut to uh, take up play here. It's got the, you know, regular gibs and get those adjusted. If they're not adjusted right, the cross slide will drift. And, uh, it's got bedway adjustments. <clears throat> I think you can see under there. Here's a gib adjustment for the bedway. There's an identical one on the other side of this 26 inch late saddle around the travadile there. Then it's got a gib back here, and I'll show you how they did that. You can see the rear way here. Let's see if I can get it in the camera. It's tapered. So the gib on the back of the carriage there, if you adjust it in or out, it, it uh, changes the tension on the bedway. And then the tailstock, to get it shifted to be able to uh, get that two ten thousandths uh, taper, which I think is great on this uh, machine that's over 80 years old. You got to work the tension on these uh, lockdown bolts here, two in front and two in the back there, and then adjust. Uh, which all, all lathes have, or most lathes, is uh, the side or lateral shift adjustments here. Get the, t you know, clamp it down, the tailstock down consistently, find the error and drift it over. I use these dial indicators here to uh, 
move this over. Well, anyway, I can consistently get a piece of uh, metal in there between uh, held in the chuck, which is what I normally do, and uh, the tail center, and uh, get that dialed in. And if it's not dialed in, um, I can adjust it so it is dialed in. I got it so this thing is turning. Within two ten thousandths, uh, with this uh, being supported by a center, then a four inch uh, long, approximately uh, one inch diameter. I'm, I'm getting uh, a half thousandths taper, not supported by the tailstock, in four inches, which is good good enough. So, to make something like this work, you, you really uh, have to spend some time figuring it out because in the manual it doesn't really mention anything about this at all uh, on the tailstock or adjusting these gibs or even the existence of them. So it, it, it takes quite a bit uh, of figuring it out yourself. I think on this machine in particular, in any machine, you know, it uh, will have its own quirks, you know, on its oiling, on its uh, adjustments, on the spindle bearings has been something that I finally got right. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show how I tested that, so uh, I'll, I'll head over and show you that. I have to put the camera on a tripod. Be right back. All right, I got this little setup here on the milling machine because it's convenient, puts it at a right height, and it's kind of tricky. Um, I have a larger surface plate. But what this is, is just a small comparator stand with a granite, uh, with a granite block. I've got a tenth reading um, indicator in there. And here, here is uh, a piece of aluminum that I turned in the axle sent over there. And I want to check it for roundness. I have a couple ways of doing it. This is a good way to do it. I have uh, V anvil micrometers, which is pretty good for a rough estimate. So I got I got this set up. I got a parallel here that I can put these uh, V blocks against. Let's get that about right. And then I got this one, two, three block to keep this uh, in the same spot. Now I turn this within two tenths too, and. Uh, so it, ma it makes it nice to uh, do this with, uh, without much taper uh, in the work part, too. So I'm going to start rotating this thing a little bit. You can see that gauge. And it gets a little bit of grit under it. And what I determined is that on this end, it's uh, the accuracy of rotation of the lathe is within 50 millionths of an inch, which is better than any uh, uh, geared head lathe that I've had. The last one was a uh, Lodge and Shipley power turn. And the best I could get out of it, it was about uh, three quarters of a tenth, or you know, 75 millionths. So I determined that this thing is just about 50 millionths, which is phenomenal for a Timken bearing headstock. I think you can see that. It's starting to head to the high spot there, which <laughs> so I, I think it's better than 50 millionths, maybe like 40. 
Okay. Now on this, this was uh, at the chuck end that I just parted it off. Now this end here was held by that uh, Royal Quad Bearing Life Center. And uh, that is not a cheap, a cheap unit, I'll tell you that. I got a little scratch in this thing. And I determined that the uh, life, by the life center holding this and the accuracy of rotation or rotational accuracy on this end is even better than the half tenth on the other end, a little less than half tenth. See if I can demonstrate that, roll it around a little bit, get a little speck of dust under this or grit. Whoop, see? A little scratch there. But anyway, it's quite a bit less than a half tenth. I can continue to roll it gently. Uh, hit another speck of dust. There, it's really stabilizing out. Okay, so that's a way of checking um, how egg shape or out of whack uh, this came off that lathe. And uh, just under 50 millionths is uh, right in the accuracy range of those type zero uh, spindle bearings. Now, let me take this loose. Now, on some other video on this thing, on this old axle sign over here, I put an indicator on the spindle nose and found that the spindle nose ran out like four ten thousandths, you know, multiple times um, run out than the rotational accuracy. So the, the spindle nose, uh, it's normal for an engine lathe like that one over there that axle sign, and I got this out of a Dean Smith and Grace manual, that uh, the spindle nose accuracy on a Dean Smith and Grace, uh, a later one, um, is a uh, half thousandths so is the maximum run out on the spindle nose and the spindle taper. Now, a lot of lathes a bit later on, they ground the spindle nose on, um, on its bearings, with it in its mounted in the headstock, rotated it then uh, cylindrical ground the face of the spindle and the tapers. So, m more modern lathes will have uh, better accuracy for the spindle nose and uh, the the spindle taper, but it doesn't affect the accuracy of rotation or rotational accuracy that I, I've shown here. So, you know, you can see that these uh, is, there's just no, uh, especially on the, the life center end here, super accurate life center, the royal, the royal quad bearing. And it's a very expensive life center that I uh, miraculously got very cheap on eBay. What a find. See, I got a little speck of dust under, under there. So what happens on a machine like this over here is you got a little bit of spindle face run out and a little bit of taper run out because they didn't grind uh, the nose in place on the bearings. So on those machines, you have to fit the chucks to, and then index the chuck to it, so you put it on the, the same, uh, same spot, same pin, and the same holes. So that's how I did that. So the chucks, I got the chucks running true by doing, 
by doing the back plates and uh, that's that's very helpful but even if if the chucks are running out also it doesn't affect this this is rotational accuracy is separate It's just amazing. There's just almost nothing out of that uh, quad bearing uh, life center. I, I thought you might find this kind of interesting. I just want to get the best possible results out of that $8,000 investment, and I'm quite satisfied. And it's taken me several hours dinking around with all the adjustments on there. Okay, I'm going to go over to this other lathe and talk about it real quick. Okay, here we are at the famous Monarch 10 double E toolmaker's lathe. Now, this lathe here has uh, the most accurate ball bearings uh, possible. And I've demonstrated before there's virtually no uh, run out in the taper or the face of the uh, spindle nose. And the rotational accuracy is considerably better than the Timken bearings. Ball bearings are just inherently uh, more accurate that way. So the test that I, I, I had it tested, um, rotational accuracy is closer to 12 millionths on this machine, 40 millionths on the, on the Axelson. Now, one of the things about this machine here is its high speeds. So it's best on a machine like this to have everything as good as it can get, including the, the, the spindle nose taper and uh, have the chucks balanced. Though I balanced the chucks on, on the old Axelson uh, just, just for... Uh, uh, to get, you know, just to kind of eliminate an out of balance problem. And things have worked out very good on, on this uh, old Axelson hanging out over here. So I'm done adjusting this machine. I believe it's as good as I can get it anyway. So that's what I've been up to off and on here. It's been kind of nice out, been taking a little dog for walks and going for bike rides and stuff. So um, I'm kind of hitting things in the shop now. And th I'm going to get the next video I'm going to do is about the Monarch 10 E and its operations. So thanks for tuning in. And I just thought I'd include you on what I'm doing. Uh, kicking around this old Axelson, and uh, my final results are quite remarkable, I think. Okay, good luck with your equipment, and uh, I will be back uh, probably tomorrow.